Solar PV Cast by Shift, a podcast exploring solar energy and the role it plays in improving our lives and our planet. Here's your host, Chris Palliser. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Solar PV Cast. My name is Chris. It is brought to you by Shift for all your solar and energy storage needs. Visit shift.ca. Now, on the podcast, we've talked about agrivoltaics before. This is this is very exciting. It's essentially animals and plants living in a a symbiotic relationship with solar panels at a solar farm. And I read a recent study uh, a couple months ago that caught my eye about agrivoltaics. Not this time on sheep, which is what we covered before. Apparently sheep are happier. Check that episode out another time. We're talking about insects. Apparently insects thrive at solar farms. And this isn't just something that somebody went out and counted in a field and said, yeah, there's lots of insects. This was a five-year study. So I'm really excited to be chatting to the person behind that study, uh, one of the people behind that study, the author, uh, from the National or Argonne National Laboratory, Argonne landscape ecologist and environmental scientist and department head, Lee Walston. Thanks for joining the podcast, Lee. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, well, appreciate the time. Um, so quickly, if you could just surmise what uh, the Argonne National Laboratory is uh, about and, and what you do there. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, so Argonne, we're, we're a federally funded research institution um, operated for the Department of Energy. Um, so we do a lot of research and a lot of work on various energy related topics. My, my job over the last few years is sort of focused on utility scale solar, large scale solar. Um, all under the umbrella of trying to make solar or try to see how we can make solar more environmentally compatible. One of the projects that we've been working on over the last few years, which you uh, uh, touched on there, was uh, the Inspire project, where we've looked at several solar projects, so several solar facilities, uh, and how different vegetation practices at those facilities might contribute to uh, biodiversity conservation. Um, and so that was sort of the the nexus behind and the impetus behind that that research study that that you you pointed out yeah and and this is important because you know I'll, the there are many positives around solar that outweigh the negatives but there are some negatives and this is one way to address that because everyone says well you need you need to take up a lot of space you need to take up a right. lot of farmland and this is obviously right. uh, one way to address that exactly yeah yeah so you you hit the, the the nail right on the head there. Um, one of the the issues with solar is the the land use capacity. Like it occupies a large footprint um, relative to other energy land uses. Um, and so one way to sort of address that is to to look at dual land uses. So the concept of dual land uses with solar is um, really growing. Agrivoltaics, as you pointed out, is is probably one of the more popular forms of dual land use at solar sites. It's really just the co-location of PV solar and any kind of agricultural practice, whether it's uh, growing crops under and between the solar arrays or livestock grazing, like you mentioned. A lot of sheep grazing has um, really become popularized at solar sites now. Um, and there's sort of a third bucket of agrivoltaics, and that is habitat enhancement at these sites, which is probably the most, uh, the, the most uh, adopted form of agrivoltaics is the habitat form, just because it's a little bit easier to, to, to do. You can do that at scale. Um, you don't need sheep, although sheep do help. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, and, um, uh, you know, cropping and, you know, does, does not necessarily need all the, the machinery and the equipment as, as cropping, although that has come a long ways as well. And it's just a matter of time before uh, you see more cropping uh, uh, designs at, at PV solar sites. So habitat enhancement, um, you know, in, in rural settings can um, have an agricultural impact, um, which was one of the, the, the areas that we f uh, focused on in our research. Um, and yeah, happy to, happy to talk about that. We're, we're really delighted to see that uh, that research get, get published. It's after five years of continuous monitoring at a couple solar sites that have been planted with habitat. Um, we essentially asked that field of dreams question, you know, um, if you build it, will <laughs> they come? Will you see that, that biodiversity response? Um, and biodiversity response meaning, do you see an increase in insects, an increase in pollinators over time with the establishment of uh, that vegetation? 
and resounding success uh, from what I read in the article. I mean, a lot of work went into this, like you mentioned, five years mm-hmm. and insects are thriving, correct? They're, they, they're doing quite well. Um, we, we started with um, basically ground zero. Um, and so there was really only one way to go. Um, and so we sort of wrote that we sort of knew what how the script was going to go or we had a good hypothesis i should say on how the script was going to go uh because we were starting at former ag sites so all of these solar sites that we studied were formerly row crop agriculture which was you know tilled and uh you know disturbed year over year for for food production for good reason for food production uh but then they were converted to solar facilities in 2017, 2017 was when they were installed for solar facilities, and they were planted with pollinator-friendly vegetation and with a mixture of natives and and clover and all sorts of uh, pollinator-friendly vegetation. They were planted in 2018, um, and so we came in beginning in 2018, and we're sort of asking the question: Well, first of all, how quickly does the vegetation establish? That was one fundamental question that um, really we had nobody's really been able to address um, at solar sites specifically Um, so we wanted to ask that question you know how quickly does the vegetation establish and then after that you know how how quickly or how um, uh, in parallel does uh, the 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 insect pollinators respond Um, and overall you know we we conducted this study from 2018 to 2022 um, and overall we saw year over year increases in the number of plants that were established and the flowering resources that were um, being established at these sites. Um, and then in turn, year over year, we also saw increases in insect abundance, uh, all sorts of insects ranging from your natural predators like beetles um, and some of the, the flies, some species of flies, all the way up to uh, some more of your more iconic pollinators like native bumblebees, for example. We saw increases in, in all of those. Incredible, and we need more bumblebees in this world. We know that for sure. Did yeah, you have like absolutely. a? Did you have like a control field uh, with no panels to kind of compare to see how did. they? Well, we sort of used year one as our control. So year, so we're basically tracking things over time and comparing um, what we saw in 2022 to what we saw in 20 or 2018. Um, in 2018, um, we've got plenty of photographs that show that in 2018, the, the entire solar site was pretty much dominated by grasses. They were not flowering very much at all. Um, and then over time, you know, 2019, we saw a few flowers. 2020, we saw a lot. And then um, it sort of, uh, uh, you know, started taking off from there. And so we didn't really have an, ab- an absolute control field throughout all four years of the study. Um, but we sort of used our, you know, year one as sort of our benchmark for things um, as they as they progressed. Um, current research, so uh, we are still conducting this research and looking at different vegetation types on the solar sites. And in that current research that we're uh, underway with, um, we are using some traditional control fields that are grassland and have always been grassland and, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Very cool. And I'm picturing yeah. like a Pixar movie in the making here, I feel like, um, under these <laughs> solar panels, uh, having the bumblebees and the beetles all playing together. And and there's a mat, there's many bonuses to this, not only in the solar f- in the solar farm field is there's this incredible biodiversity, but the ripple effects of the fields around it. I was reading in the article about like a soy field is benefiting kind of thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that was one of the questions we wanted, wanted to answer in this study was not only do we see on-site um, benefits, but is there the possibility for off-site lands to benefit as well? And so one one thing about these solar sites, at least in the Midwest, is um, the, the solar sites are surrounded by other row crop agricultural fields. Um, and, and many of them are soybean fields, which soybeans are not traditionally known to be pollinator dependent, but there's some research and literature out there suggesting that pollinators do help. Pollinators do help soybean yields a little bit, even though they're not traditionally known to be uh, pollinator dependent. And so with that in mind, we wanted to sample in some of these nearby soybean fields that are still soybean fields, but they're just close to the solar sites 
um, that have been planted with habitat. And over time, we found that, yeah, the, that uh, spillover effect is, is um, uh, from the, the solar sites into the soybean fields um, is greater. So we, we actually saw um, greater numbers of pollinators in the soybean fields visiting soybean flowers um, closer to the solar facilities where that habitat was planted and restored um, as compared to soybean fields that were farther away from the solar facilities or soybean fields that were more um, uh, interior, meaning they were not anywhere close to any field edges or close to the to the solar facilities at all. So um, that 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 told us that, you know, these solar facilities could um, act as uh, sources for pollinators that could then also uh, migrate off site to some of these adjacent farm fields and help pollinate those those crops. Amazing. And just to confirm, this was in Minnesota where the study took place? Correct. It was Minnesota. Okay. Yeah, I was reading too that uh, I think something like 10 million acres of land is going to be needed by 2050 uh, to for solar generation, just to diversify the energy portfolio. And so That's right. there's no question we need the land. This is all about how, how we can maximize the land and, and how it corresponds into that that boom with solar with solar that's right yeah yeah um 10 million acres that's roughly the amount of land that the department of energy has projected needed by 2050 in order to meet decarbonization goals um that 10 million acres it sounds like that's a lot but there's a lot of um agricultural land and a lot of other um previously disturbed formerly used lands that are out there um, that, you know, uh, could be suitable for solar that would allow for practices such as this, such as pollinator habitat, habitat enhancement at solar sites to be compatible and allow, allow uh, these sites to be multifunctional, right? Um, uh, these, these dual uses that, that would help um, uh, allow solar to be more, better integrated in, in these existing landscapes, right? Um, and that's that's the whole purpose behind this this entire study is to see how uh, feasible that is. Demonstrate that it's um, feasible, um, at least in in, in Minnesota. Uh, demonstrate its feasibility and and show how this can be done um, possibly in, in other regions. Um, other regions, you know, have different soil types, different climates. Uh, different agricultural practices in the region. And so we obviously don't expect, you know, this one size fits all kind of thing to uh, solar and habitat. But the concept is largely the same. Um, figuring out what native um, and non-native, but what might be the most appropriate um, seed mixes uh, for that region, um, developing management strategies for that vegetation um, and, and figuring out how to, to optimize that vegetation uh, uh, strategy with the the pollinator community that might be present at that site um, again to optimize those those biodiversity benefits and possibly the the services that could be provided to off-site agriculture it's incredible i mean multiple uses for one thing is is the goal in right. in everything we do and so you know it's it's so wonderful to hear that this research is happening because it's not just we're putting solar panels on a field and we're moving on we're trying to dig even deeper, literally, and plant uh, and plant some things. And and you mentioned previously disturbed land. So how is the selection process when they put in a solar farm? Uh, they're obviously not going to go to some farmer who's producing food, which we obviously need, especially as, as with inflation and the cost of food. Um, so how do they select where the solar farm goes? And then, you know, I guess how does the study play into that? That's a really good question, and for research scientists like me, that's that's something that we haven't been able to really answer. There might be some other decisions and some other factors um, that you know we haven't been able to, to to really understand. But those are the optimum places from an ecological point of view. From an ecological point of view, the best places to site solar or any development, for that matter are previously disturbed lands, right? Because those are going to be areas that are already ecologically compromised. Um, right. And so you would expect then that uh, the the impacts of construction and operation of that facility would not be as severe, theoretically, would not be as severe as siting that project in a native forest or a prairie system 
those kinds of things. So um, from an ecological point of view, the most important part of solar development, first and foremost, is is siting, having these projects sited on uh, sited appropriately on previously used disturbed lands. Um, the factors behind those decisions, um, you know, there's it, those are sort of out of our research domain and out of our, our, our area of specialty. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you can imagine that probably um, economics come into play that, uh, you know, land prices, um, there might be some cost behind, some calculation behind the scenes on what might be more productive for a farmer, um, you know, to maybe divvy up part of their land for, you know, keeping some of that land still in agricultural production, then maybe divvying up a portion of that land for solar development. Those calculations eventually may have come out to um, some agreement to, to um, allow uh, solar development on those on those formerly agricultural lands. Well, and it and it it makes sense now too because of those ripple effects of yeah. the bonus. So maybe you do have yep. a large plot of land. You've got some previously disturbed land, so you're not. It's already been compromised, as you said. So you put a solar farm in the middle of it, and guess what? All of that agricultural land around you is going to produce even more. Absolutely. And most of these solar developments are not outright purchased from the farmer or from the landowner. They are leases, implying that after a certain amount of time, maybe 20 or 30 years over the life of a solar lease, um, that land can be uh, returned back to the farmer um, and put back into agric agricultural production. Um, 20 to 30 years of habitat enhancement on the site could do a lot of great benefits to improve soil health, which could then later on down the road, once it's converted back to agricultural production, increase uh, that, that production even more. So there are a lot of on-site uh, and off-site benefits um, uh, to, uh, you know, for, for the, the farming community with, with solar. Um, but of course, you know, 20 to 30 years of solar would also mean that, you know, uh, some of the more direct agricultural practices on that land um, would 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 maybe not be compatible. Although there are some cropping agrivoltaics um, uh, concepts and strategies that are being implemented and currently under research, that it's just a matter of time before we start to see more of those um, ideas um, scale up and be more um, readily implemented. Um, but but you're right, you're right. Um, solar energy development in these agricultural landscapes. Um, can can really um, help both offsite farmers um, and and the farmers that are leasing their land to to solar companies um, for future uh, uh, crop production. Yeah, right now in Alberta, in Canada, um, they they had a moratorium on large solar farms and and installations uh -huh. because the farmers were concerned what's going to happen to the field in twenty five thirty years when the lease is right. up and the panels aren't producing as much. So this study truly does play into that. Like you said, you know, spend all that time enriching that soil, produce a ton of mm -hmm. clean energy. And then at the end, if you, if you decide to get the field back and all of a sudden you're right, it's going to have this incredibly rich soil and, and diversity in that area. Right, right. So there's, there's research underway right now to help develop um, uh, frameworks to measure and quantify soil health and how carbon gets stored in soils at solar sites so that that can be tracked over time um, to see how, uh, you know, at, at the end of a solar lease, you know, for example, how much, how mu how much uh, carbon has been so sequestered in these soils um, at the solar sites over, over time. So there's already research underway to try to, to try to help understand how these solar sites are contributing to soil health. But that is, that is critical <laughs> to, to, to uh, you know, successful farming is having good, healthy soils. And um, that's, that's certainly one, one way that um, solar, solar sites can help. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Yeah. How, what do you enjoy most about doing this research and, and you know, uh, learning these things as you go in your everyday life? One, one excitement, one exciting thing about this kind of research is um, it's so new and it's changing so quickly. Um, the term solar pollinator habitat or solar habitat friendly solar, um, I don't think that was even a word, you know, five, six, seven years ago, eight years ago. <laughs> I mean, things, things have happened just so quickly in just the last five years. 
the world of agrivoltaics has really taken off more than just a uh, just a, a little concept to now things that are in practice where strategies and and uh, you know solar companies are working with um, uh, farmers and producers to to um, you know optimize crop production at solar solar facilities. So the whole world of agrivoltaics is so new and it's uh, rapidly evolving. And so I I like it because it because of that it's sort of um, you know uh, it's it's new and emerging. Um, Oops, sorry, my, my thumb slipped, slipped there. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a great uh, fast paced um, field that um, has has been really exciting to work in. And I'm, I, as an ecologist, I really enjoy the the habitat side of things and seeing what um, how habitat matures and and what is um, looking at habitat enhancement at solar facilities from a uh, from a possibility standpoint to a realistic standpoint. There's a spectrum there where um, solar facilities are they they are well intentioned and they provide a lot of habitat. Some some facilities might be able to provide um, you know really high diverse high growing seed mixes. Other facilities maybe because their panels are closer to the ground or maybe because the panels are are really close together. There are some realities with some solar facilities that might not allow them to plant the most optimum seed mix right um, but they're still able to do something they're still able to maybe plant a general seed mix that still allows some floral resources to establish at the solar site that can still provide some sort of net benefit to biodiversity that's still a benefit that's still good that's still better than the alternative mm -hmm. right? which um, the alternative ecologically speaking was not very much the alternative was row crop agriculture which was the previous land use so we tend to look at things along that gradient where there are some solar sites that, you know, for they're, they're raised high off the ground. The panels are elevated off the ground. They're able to do a lot more, um, and they're, they're able to plant a very diverse seed mix that also requires maybe a little bit more management. So there's also some management that's involved uh, with mowing and making sure, you know, invasive, invasive species are, are kept at bay, those kinds of things. Um, and so things are, are sort of along a spectrum. And what we're starting to see is, depending on siting and how the projects are sited, even projects that are, you know, sort of planting low diversity, low growing seed mixes are still seeing net positive biodiversity benefits um, in, in these, in, in these um, you know, pollinator plantings on their solar sites. So I really enjoy seeing that and seeing how, um, you know, that uh, all the different um, I don't want to say options, but the different uh, the constraints and the realizations at solar sites kind of play out in terms of what can be planted, what gets established, and what kinds of ecological outcomes can we see at these sites. Sorry, that was and a it's... really long winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can you can tell you enjoy what you do, and I love yeah. that. And and honestly, uh, it's it's all positive. It, it's all, it all has a positive light on it. And I, like yeah, you said, for, something is better than nothing, especially compared to the alternative of mining or right. anything like that. Exactly. We, we kind of keep it in that, in that context, um, you know, for sites that were constructed for solar facilities that were constructed on ecologically valuable land. Let's say a forest was, was uh, completely, um, you know, cut down in order to make way for um, a solar facility. You know, there the bar might have been raised pretty high, right? You you raised the bar because mm -hmm. you 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 took down something that was of ecological value. Um, mm -hmm. In order to offset those impacts, that bar has been raised. That ecological bar has been raised. But at so at many solar sites where you're looking at, you know, former ag land, former disturbed lands, that ecological bar to start has been lowered. So much so that it does not take much to, or in theory, I should say, it does not take much to see these biodiversity gains. And that's really what we saw in the outcomes of this study that, that we published was, you know, their former ag lands, former ag fields, they offered very little value to begin with. So what if, what if they were now planted with solar panels, um, they're planted with solar panels and they're planted with, <laughs> you know, native habitat. Um, what what do we see? Um, and we saw a, a a good response in the the vegetation that established many of the the flowering plant species uh, that were that were planted uh, bloomed within the first three years. Uh, we saw them come back in the first three years after they were planted, and in turn we also saw the pollinators, um, especially those native bees. Those native bees did a really good job of 
coming back and, and showing up on those on those flowers. And so um, whether it's high diverse, highly, um, you know, tall growing native plant species or whether it's a low diverse um, plant mix, it all comes back to siding. And um, I think, you know, it's if you build it, yes, they they will come. You will see a positive response um, in, in the pollinator community um, um, as as a result. That's great. And not yeah. not to mention these fields are also producing clean energy. Like there's yeah. so much so many benefits here. Yeah. How did you count the bugs? Or you yeah, know what I mean? How does that I'm just trying question. to get, wrap around that. That's a good question. So we set up transects and uh, these transects were were 100 feet long and so we set up a number of transects at every solar facility um and we just walked each transect at a pace at a pace that would get us through the transect in about five minutes. So these are about five minute walks and several. So we did several five minute walks around the, the solar sites and we just counted the number of, of pollinators that we saw. So it was sort of like mm. just taking tally, taking tally of the number of different pollinators we saw. So we didn't collect, we didn't, we didn't collect or touch any of the pollinators. It was all observational and we just took count of all the ones that we saw. Um, as you might expect, in the early years, uh, when there were no flowers, there were nothing was flowering. Um, it was pretty simple. There were a lot of low numbers. There, there weren't zeros. We, there were many hmm. times where we actually saw pollinators, even when um, there wasn't, there weren't very many flowering resources. There, there wasn't much flowering. We still saw pollinators, but those numbers definitely increased, and we we were definitely busy. Um, scribbling our, our tally marks in the later years um, when there were a lot of things flowering and we did see a lot of a lot of pollinators. Yeah. One one thing, <laughs> uh, one other thing that we saw is, um, you know, there's been such a, an emphasis on the decline of the monarch butterfly lately. Um, over time at these solar sites, we also saw um, and this was not published in our study. This is this is sort of anecdotal, but we also have some empirical data on this that we're going to try to publish. But we saw some increases in um uh, uh milkweed uh the the host plant for monarch butterfly um we saw increased abundance of milkweed um at these solar sites over time and as a result we also saw increased numbers of monarch butterflies at these sites over time so a very specific type of pollinator that we don't really get into in that in that study that you're that that was mentioned here um but just sort of anecdotally and also you know we do have some we do have some data to support this that we're, that we're working on, but it's just one other example that even specific species that might be of conservation concern, like the monarch butterfly, could see some benefits from this kind of habitat approach. Incredible. And and because you are doing the seeding, you can kind of plan that. Now that you've got right. some basic knowledge here, you can say, monarchs are struggling. I've got a way we can help. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And some yeah. of these milkweed species, they are appropriately named milkweed because they grow pretty well um uh, there are some species of milkweed like common milkweed for example that um we had show up in some of our sites even if they were not planted with milkweed they they were able to um, retain in the the seed bank or they they were blown in from other offsite areas uh milkweed seeds are often you know wind blown and um and so uh we saw a great proliferation of, of milkweed at many of our sites um that we uh, that we surveyed in the Midwest, um, and it just goes to show that if you know if you take take some measures to to allow habitat to establish, um, things sort of um, sort of naturally come back, right? Um, and, yeah. Uh, you know, milkweed is one. Well, not always, but milkweed is a good example of um, in some cases where um, it, it's able to to come back, um, especially in these agricultural landscapes. And um, yeah, and it might be a, a benefit for for pollinators such as uh, monarch butterflies. That's great. What's the feedback been like, uh, you know, from the laboratory, from your colleagues and from the public uh, with yeah, the study being published? It's been, it's been overall positive. We do get a lot of questions about um, how feasible is this in other regions, um, like in the southwest um, or in the south or in the northeast. Um, it looks like it makes sense, or at least our example study makes sense in the Midwest. Um, but how applicable is, you know, solar and habitat in other regions? And um we do have, well, I'm aware of other research that's being um, undertaken in other regions that are looking at the feasibility of different vegetation types and the, the, uh, the how different vegetation uh, types grow at solar facilities in other regions. And um, 
I, I think it's it's um, something promising. The 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 look and the feel and the the implementation of solar habitat might not be the same in every region. Um, in the West, for example, where it's more arid and vegetation takes longer to grow, um, it, it might take a little bit longer for habitat to establish in Western systems. Um, in other regions, we might be looking at different types of uh, uh, seed mixes, maybe more wet dominated seed mixes rather than upland dominated seed mixes, um, those kinds of things. And so it's it's really important to um, uh, to, to understand the soils and the, the characteristics of the seed mixes for that region and, and select seed mixes that are appropriate for that region. Um, but I think I'm optimistic. I, I think there is a um, a working um, solution for, for solar sites in almost every region that uh, will enhance habitat um, for that region. Now, it might not result in a 10 out of 10, you know, perfectly optimal um, habitat type for that region, in the Midwest, for example, the Midwest is prairie country, right? We're talking about lands that have been historically uh, converted from prairie to row crop agriculture. Now we're taking that row crop agriculture, putting in a solar, and we're putting habitat on that. Should we put solar, should we make that solar habitat as uh, uh, functional as a restored prairie, right? Essentially asking, should solar companies be restoring back to native prairie. I don't think that that's really what we're trying to get at here, nor is that really, you know, what solar companies, the solar industry needs to do. Solar industry should not be restoring prairies, but totally. if they can if they can restore some habitat to a certain level, what is that level? Your guess is as good to mine. Something better than zero, right? Something mm -hmm. is better than nothing, right? If they yeah. can do something to restore habitat somewhere um, in there that's better better than the alternative, that's kind of what we're striving for, right? Um, and so that's kind of where we're we're thinking about things. Um, it's great if solar companies can, you know, uh, restore habitat to, to greater levels, maybe levels that, that resemble, uh, uh, you know, prairie habitats, restored prairie habitats. But um, we, we just got to, you know, kind of keep in mind, you know, sort of the perspectives and the, 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 the context behind um, all of all of these things that, you know, maybe maybe solar pollinator habitat is, um, you know, uh, uh, working working very well at a certain functional level. And if all solar sites functioned at that ecological level in terms of habitat provision, um, it would be a tremendous, I believe, a tremendous amount of biodiversity uplift compared to what they what they were offering previously in the previous land use well and that's exactly it i think you you got to look at the big picture with it all compared right. to what you said a few times better than the alternative this is right. so much better than right. the other ways we got our energy uh right. and we took it from the earth you know what and, i mean so exactly and in, in a way it's sort of a no-brainer i mean if you think about it you, you you say okay going from an agricultural field to a solar field with some wildflowers. Yeah, no brainer. It's going to it's going to do better than and but really there hasn't been any research or anything collected to really demonstrate that. So some of these foundational studies that demonstrate that are really important. I would say we still need more. We need more studies that show how this can be done and what this might look like in different regions, right? So yeah. it's well, it's all well, really yeah. It's all really positive and honestly, you know, like you said, five years ago, agrivoltaics wasn't a thing. So the right. fact that it's this new and yet it still is so obvious that it's a good thing, like, you know, 50 years ago when they were mining for oil or putting oil derricks in, they weren't five years into it thinking, how can we grow wildflowers around these oil derricks? Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so it's, it's, it's all changing and... Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really exciting. Um, there's there's a lot of exciting research that's underway right now across the country. Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 great. I think it's wonderful that that we're looking at this and we're having these conversations and and we're being mindful. And I think it's so great that everyone who's looking at renewable energy, you know, obviously from an eco uh, economy standpoint, it makes a lot of sense, which is why it's booming. But I think it's wonderful that that people that are renewable energy minded are also those that are caring for the planet and looking right. how to do better. And so when you approach it, it in this manner of how can we do better, I think this is, is wonderful. And it's wonderful to hear, as you mentioned, that the solar companies are, are on board. Mm -hmm. Yep. At 100 percent, we 
every solar company that we talk to, they're very much interested in providing habitat. It's, it's, you know, by virtue of being in the renewable energy sector, right, there's, there's this interest. And so that's great to see. There is a passion to, to do better. Um, you know, like all other forms of in, uh, energy and industry, um, you know, there is sort of a bottom line. And so that bottom line kind of helps us understand, okay, what, what is the best we can do with this bottom line? Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. 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 Yeah, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for for chatting with us uh, about this this article. I'm going to share the link with the podcast, and and um, I think it's all good news. Honestly, it's the future is bright. Not to make a corny solar joke there, but you know, the birds and the, I think there's some joke about the birds and the bees and the solar, and there's something in there. <laughs> but it's all good news. Lee Walston is an ecologist and scientist with the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, they just released a study on how insects and, and bugs and habitat biodiversity is thriving in solar fields. And that's what we've been chatting about on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time today to chat with us, Lee. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank, thank you for having me. The Solar PV Cast by Shift with Chris Palliser. To begin your solar journey, visit shift.ca.